Do you ever wish time would slow down a little bit? Maybe to spend more time on hobbies or with family or just to enjoy your morning coffee. Well, you're in luck because all you need to do is travel close to the speed of light and time dilation will take care of the rest. Sort of. I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, three experts discuss the philosophy and science of space and time, and how they unify into what we call space-time. We begin now with a few of Newton and Einstein's thoughts on how we measure time. For Newton, time is absolute. God wears the divine Rolex, and all of reality is divided up into absolute time slices. That is, three-dimensional spaces arranged in an absolute order. Think of a film. Not the movie you watch, but the film itself on the reel that would go through the projector. It was a long strip comprised of individual frames. Each frame is the entirety of space, and the order of the frames is the entirety of time for the movie. Film space is absolute because for each thing we can say exactly how far something is over and up from the bottom left-hand corner of the frame in which it appears. And time is absolute because we can say exactly how many frames into the movie it is. Space and time are both absolute and independent. Einstein knew this concept of space was wrong. His hero, H.A. Lawrence, had described the way lengths contract for moving observers. But no one understood why this happened. Indeed, pretty much everyone, including Lawrence himself, thought it was a quirk of math. It didn't really happen. But Einstein took the math seriously. The transformation equation said it did, so that's what the physics tells us about the world. But why? He took a long walk in the mountains with a friend, thinking about this question. He took the train back home to Bern. Glancing over his shoulder at the clock on the train station as he walked away from it, it hit him. The clock does not show what time it is. The clock shows what time it was. To read the clock, light bounces off the clock and travels to your eye. But he was walking away from the clock. The light would not only have to reach him, it would have to catch up with him to do it. If an observer moves away from the clock, the light would arrive slightly later. The faster he went, the more it would have to do to catch up to him. So the faster he walked away from the clock, the slower the clock would appear to move. Remember that Einstein at this point was under the spell of Ernst Mach's positivism. What is real is what's observable, what we measure. Time is what the clock tells us it is. So if the clock is moving slower for moving observers, then time itself slows when observers move. What Lawrence had done for length also needed to be done for duration. This was the key to the special theory of relativity. This effect is called time dilation. Time passes at different rates for different observers moving at different speeds. It was most colorfully illustrated by Einstein's friend, the French physicist Paul Langevin, with his famous twins paradox. Suppose we have two twins who are both 20 years old. One stays on Earth, while the other becomes an astronaut. The astronaut travels very fast for the duration of the mission, returning to Earth 20 Earth years later. The twin who was left on Earth will be 20 years older, that is, 40 years old. The twin stepping out of the rocket will only be 37 years old. The astronaut twin doesn't just look younger, but using a clock and a calendar would have only experienced 17 years in the same time the earthbound twin experienced 20. The passing of time is a relative measure. Einstein understood this, but he did not, however, fully understand the philosophically radical nature of the insight. After he published it, The paper was read by a mathematician turned physicist named Hermann Minkowski, who did understand exactly how radical it was. Minkowski had been one of Einstein's teachers and was a better mathematician than Einstein. What he realized was that Einstein had unified space and time into what we now call space-time. Essentially, space and time are now known to be the same thing. Further, what he realized was that Einstein's transformation equations were just rotations in space-time. But what it means to do a rotation in space-time is tough to get your head around. 
So let's use a familiar analogy of a two-dimensional vector from introductory algebra. Start out drawing an x and y axis and a vector of some fixed length. Now let's spin that vector however we want. It can point along the x-axis with nothing along the y-axis, or it could go the other way, pointing along the y-axis and not the x. Or it could point somewhere between the two, pointing a little bit in the x-direction and a little bit in the y-direction. No matter what direction the vector points, the length is always the same. So that's one conclusion. The length of the vector doesn't care about x and y individually. And equivalently, you could keep the vector stationary and rotate the axes. The projections of the vector on the x and y axes change, even though the vector doesn't. That is at the core of Minkowski's insight. In relativity, the mathematics are pretty similar. Now, instead of x and y being the horizontal and vertical axes, just imagine that the horizontal axis is space and the vertical axis is time. So let's think about a person who is stationary in space. They only experience translations through time and none through space. So their space-time vector is pointing upwards along the time axis. On the other hand, we saw that a person moving faster and faster compared to you experienced times that were shorter and shorter. And when you get to the speed of light, the time experienced by that person eventually goes to zero. So at the speed of light, there is only moving through space and no movement through time. That means that the space-time vector becomes horizontal. The only changes to experience are in space, while there's no changes in time. And, of course, if a person is moving at a velocity through space less than the speed of light, they're experiencing both changes in space and time. The important point is that a person's space-time vector, that is, the combined experience of both space and time, is unchanged. One person might experience more space and less time, while another might experience more time and less space. But the combination, the length of the space-time vector, is something everyone agrees on. And this has absolutely huge consequences. It means that a person's velocity through space-time is constant, and further, their speed is the speed of light. A stationary person is moving through time at the speed of light, while a person moving 100% through space, and not at all through time, is moving at the speed of light through space. And that is a deep and fundamental and completely satisfying answer for the question of why can't you go faster than the speed of light? It's because that everything is always going at that one single speed. And it also shows in the most intimate of ways how space and time are one and the same, and how you experience the two is just a matter of perspective. Special relativity had explained the relationship between space and time. General relativity which Einstein developed between 1907 and 1915, expanded this work to describe the relationship between space, time, and gravity. We imagine this today by invoking the concept of space-time, with space and time inextricably linked to make up the fabric of our universe. In special relativity, we imagine space-time as flat, with something like light traveling neatly along straight lines. But in general relativity, when we introduce gravity, space-time becomes curved. An object with a lot of mass, like a planet or star, will affect space-time thanks to the effects of its gravitational field, warping the fabric of the universe and appearing to bend the path that light takes as it travels, changing its apparent position and travel time. According to general relativity, our own sun should influence the light of background stars as it passes in front of them. The subtle warping of space-time from our sun's mass should deflect the path of the light as it travels from the background stars to Earth, subtly shifting the apparent position of stars near the sun. Einstein's general relativity equations allowed him to calculate exactly what this expected shift would be. And while it was small, the observational astronomy experts of the era, like George Ellery Hale, confirmed to Einstein that it would be detectable with cutting-edge telescope technology. The difficulty, of course, is that when the sun is visible, it outshines the light of any stars in the sky. For the best test, Astronomers would need to observe stars incredibly close to the sun, 
right at the most blinding point in the daytime sky. The only way to accomplish this would be during a total solar eclipse. At the moment of totality, a few short minutes when the moon perfectly blocks the sun, the sun would be in position to bend the light of background stars and the stars themselves would actually be visible. Astronomical photographs of those stars near the sun taken during an eclipse could then show whether there was the shift in apparent position predicted by Einstein. So, the British astronomer Arthur Stanley Eddington was placed in charge of a project that sent two expeditions out to observe the eclipse of 1990. One in South America and one off the coast of Africa. We knew this, what the sky would look like if the sun were not so bright. It's what the night sky looked like six months earlier when we were on the other side of the sun. So, when the eclipse occurred, we knew precisely what star should be just next to the blocked out sun. If Newton is right, that star should appear right where it's supposed to be. But if Einstein's right, that star should be shifted slightly. It's light bent by the gravity of the sun. Eddington's team took photos. The data was analyzed and Einstein was spot on. Word was sent immediately to Einstein in Germany. He opened the telegram, read it, and calmly handed it to a graduate student who was meeting with him at the time. She read the news and knew what it meant. Einstein had changed everything. The evidence was in. Yet, the man was completely calm. Shocked by his placid demeanor, she asked, what would Einstein have thought if the results had been different, if Newton's predictions had been the ones that were verified? He looked at her and said, I would have felt pity for the dear Lord. The theory is right. No one ever accused Albert Einstein of excessive modesty. The idea that space is curved captured the imagination. It's responsible for much of the long distance travel in contemporary science fiction. Hyperspace in Star Wars, subspace in Star Trek. If the special theory of relativity is correct and the greatest speed attainable is that of light, then most of the universe would be inaccessible to beings with a limited lifespan. So, if we're going to explore the greater universe, we need to travel faster than the speed of light, but that can't be done. Or can it? The key to these sci-fi fixes is to realize that when Einstein says space-time itself is curved, we're not talking about a surface in space, but space itself. When trying to picture this, we use the example of a globe, right? That is a two-dimensional surface on a sphere that resides in a larger three-dimensional world. But for Einstein, there is no bigger universe in which the universe is set. It's space-time itself that curves in the presence of matter and other forms of energy. This is hard to picture, but the thought on the part of science fiction writers is that if I want to get from one place on the Earth's equator to another, I could follow the equator following, you know, the shortest path on the surface of the globe. Or I could tunnel through the Earth and create a straight line path that would be even shorter. By analogy, if space-time curves, I could follow the path light takes, the shortest path in space, or maybe I could tunnel through space to create a straight line and a shorter path. This would let me move faster than light and allow, in principle, for travel to otherwise inaccessible regions of the universe through such wormholes or hyperspace as we find in Star Trek, Star Wars, and Doctor Who. Each of these, of course, has its own way of creating and massaging the route through a non-existent trajectory in space. I'll leave it up to their respective fan bases to hash out which is most likely true, given our best theories of space-time and motion and gravitation, You'll find this a topic on which much conversation exists, much of it on the internet. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all now on Wondrium.